Uh, and composing like every single day, not one single day off for like uh, two months, at least 14 hours every day. I was getting going crazy at the end, you know. Yeah, that was kind of the 
was very heavy work, you know. But so it was like you know you you worked most of the night, started sleeping uh, close to dawn more or less, you know, and then you slept for some hours. You got up around like one or two in the afternoon, and you started going all over again. So most of the stuff was done during night anyway, just sitting there with a few candles, playing guitars, you know, and. Uh, recording on a four track machine we programmed drums during the day and uh, recorded guitars and uh, keyboards on this four track thing uh, during night storm that was just like two months and then we had 10 days uh, rehearsal with the guys before entering the studio how about the sound of the album like how would you characterize any difference between this one and there's a few differences uh, overall on the album you know the, the time is like it, this is 47 minutes plus which is the longest album we ever did. And in my opinion, it has by far the most accessible sound that we've had. Uh, really clean, clear sound everywhere. The guitar sound is really, what should I say, it has a lot of body, but it's crisp still, you know. It's, there's a lot of power in it, but still very accessible, uh, enjoyable to listen to. Something specifically about the vocals is that in, in the earlier productions, I realized when I hear this stuff now that I've tended to uh, push the treble too much, you know, for the vocals, which sometimes might have made in, in certain people's ears, you know, a little annoying to listen to that crispy, treble-ish vocal when I hit high notes. Doing the same high notes on this album, they suddenly have that has a lot of body to it, and it sounds different. And it sounds like our sound engineer, live sound engineer, put it pretty well because he listened to the stuff said my god it, it sounds like you king it's it really sounds like you <laughs> oh yeah i realized yeah it, it does do you find your voice changing at all as you get older like you know getting more depth out of it yeah 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 no i i'd say i've i i keep uh, finding new ways of singing and, and new voices to use because all the old voices are in there more or less yeah uh, but basically, I'm using the normal voice a little bit more on this album, I guess, than, than, than on the other albums. And uh, and again, for Sleepless Nights, for instance, with, with these slow parts, it's probably the softest voice I've ever used in my life. I like that part of that song, too. That really deep, brow voice. Yeah. That's like the most, like, <coughs> and you know what? you've ever done. <laughs> The thing that, uh, but there's something special about that part because we try, we avoid, or I want to avoid using harmonizer on the vocals. There are no harmonizers in the vocals. And that part, to me, it sounds like there are harmonizers on the vocals. Actually, there are seven tracks, seven voices on that part you're talking about. It sounds like one. And the reason why it sounds like one is we couldn't get it dry enough to took all effects off. There, there are no effects whatsoever on took all the effects off and still it was not dry enough to my liking and then finally uh, the engineer worked us for a long long time all the while I said okay the last thing we can try to get it as dry as you want because that was like <laughs> it's like this had the voices in mono for just that piece so then making the voices seven voices that were spread out on this mono got them in there and then it sounds like it's that kind of thing because there are seven of them and not all in the sink, you know. Yeah. I also noticed on that song, even on a couple of the other songs too, you started to seem to be using more like this really interesting acoustic guitar almost sound. Yeah. Like uh, that really pretty kind of picking sound. Mm -hmm. So yeah, on that song and on another one too. Yeah, there's a two minute intro for one of them, like very quiet, uh, A Visit from the Dead. There's like a long acoustic intro with it. Yeah, it's going to be very, uh, and I think live, you know, that we can like bring all the heavy stuff down just for a short while, you know, and then try and play, you know, use acoustic guitars on stage for the first time ever, you know. Exactly, yes. Really heavy parts that's right. And that's the whole point of also, you know, like, when you think about 
using a certain kind of voice or whatever, a certain kind of anything, you, the more you use that same thing, the less effect it has all the time. And again, you know, the fewer times a certain thing comes, the heavier the effect is. The other thing about, about that song, this night, is it, it's, uh, I mean, you said the album in general is more accessible, but I think that song in particular, I mean, I Yes, that's right. could really get into that, you might not have heard you before, or really, like, you know, I think that song could really break into a lot of the mm -hmm. that Yeah. something you wanted to try? Yes, absolutely, exactly what you're saying, you know, that's going to be the video. Because we know that, that our hardcore fans, they know what we're about and we're never selling out anything. Because what is great about this album is that it's more accessible because of the production, but there are no compromises in the music. And that's what's really good about this. And again, the, the song Sleepless Night is probably the song with the most catchy pieces in it. Yeah. As, as just in one song, you know. So we're definitely going to push that song as a video. And then uh, hopefully uh, that way, you know, gain some more fans uh, before we can get the opportunity to, to go out and open up for someone, you know. Have you got any kind of concrete thing towards the video yet? We have some ideas. Uh, there is a very long guitar solo part in there where Pete and Andy has each their guitar solo. It's a long, maybe one and a half minute or so, where you, there's guitar solo. But that gives us a good opportunity to depict stuff that is going on elsewhere in the story instead of just portray that one lyric. So when there are voices, or when there are vocals, you know, we'll depict what goes on in the vocals, and then we can put other stuff in there. And we want to incorporate the new live production into this video. So the people get an idea what it's going to look like when they go and see us live. One or two illusions will be incorporated as well. But it's not going to be shot just like that, or only like that, because we want to try and incorporate old classic black and white horror stuff. So it's gonna be black and white and color. If, if you can imagine like uh, from the Frankenstein movie when they're digging up this coffin, the coffin comes up, you know, and then clicks right over into uh, the illusion with cremation where you see them color on stage being performed. One camera, there are no camera tricks, you know, one camera filming that illusion and then that should give some impact, I think, you know, people uh, will get a good idea what would go on live and they'll have associations to, like, the, the good old horror days of black and white and shoot some of the stuff of us black and white, but again, definitely uh, in color as well. That would be neat because, I mean, I've always seen a lot of your music that way. As opposed to, like, I mean, a lot of the modern horror stuff, you know, like, the Dead Kennedys or something like that, they don't have that certain, uh, I guess, gothic. Exactly. And the cars as well, like, you know, they're all in that kind of style. How would it, do you have like a record cover done already? Or? It's not done, but there were, we just went there uh, to check out how the, the whole artwork is going and... I heard it was going to have like you and the coffin on the back, like everybody else, you guys standing around. Mm -hmm. There's this black coffin that uh, says King Diamond and Silver Letters and the band stands behind the coffin uh, like a funeral parlor. <laughs> but they wanted some kind of... Uh, wanted me to be there, to, to have the face there. Uh, on the common some way, so we're incorporating me somewhere, not in that picture, because that's going to have a frame around it, that picture. It's just me, it's not in the picture, it's Andy and Pete and Hal, all standing there with top hats and this looking like a room bar. And then this black coffin and a nice frame around it, but somewhere, I'm going to lie like this, you know, and then you'll see the spirit rising up from me as well. Kind of like what happens after the burning. How did it feel to put yourself off as a... As a <laughs> really strange, I tell you. The more you think about it, the weirder it gets. And a lot of the things that, that, that uh, is in the vocals this time around, you know, makes me so like, strange. When Missy is warning me, you know, you hear your own voice warning yourself off, you know, uh, can't beware, something bad is coming your way. <laughs> and then having to die every night on stage, you know, and uh, kind of seeing your funeral on, on the back of the car. You know, it's like, you know, nobody tends to fool around with this, so we'll do it for them, that's, that's it. Do you think, I mean, the ending of this song, I mean, it's, 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 it
this one isn't quite as ambiguous as the last one, but still, it, the last thing you say is that you're going to come back to more. <laughs> There's not going to be an earthly continuation. There's not going to be an earthly continuation. <laughs> we won't say about the... Uh, no, I have a vague idea that I've fooled around with for a while. I don't know. It, you never know. We'll see what, what happens at that time. But I'm not going to continue the story as... Uh, uh, exact, not in exactly the same thing. Then it's going to be around... Uh, at, it's going to be a different subject, but it, it might be as a result of what has happened in those two albums. How about a, um, I think something would be really interesting. Did you ever think about maybe making them into a movie or a book or a you know, like graphic you know, art book or something? Right now, when it comes to movies, like we are, there is a movie in the making called Box. It's spelled B O G G S. And uh, we were approached by those movie makers. Uh, to uh, do the uh, music for the ending credits. And we wrote that just before Christmas on this four track machine as well, which will be a full band piece. And uh, the guy really liked the mood of the whole thing, the way it was uh, put together, you know. It was put together where you have this slow, nice thing, you know, where you kind of sit there wondering what's been going on in the movie, you know. And then suddenly you've been taken out of it by some heavier stuff suddenly appearing, and then it turns around again. And you fall away from this heavy feeling of where you're actually not listening to the music anymore, but like maybe wondering what was going on the movie. And then again, you'll be taken back to listen to the music. So it's like, and then uh, we just did some horror themes on our own. You know, just did a couple of horror themes and, and sent the stuff to to the, the director. And you know, said, listen to this stuff, you know, you might find it interesting enough for you to move, uh, to use in the movie. And there was like insect theme and uh, dream sequence and whatever we call these things that fit in there. And he was, he really liked it a lot. So we'll see what happens, whether we are going to, you know, be able to do even some more stuff there, have a theme coming back for a certain parts there. That was great. Do you have a question about your own, like, Yeah, you see, because I... Uh, he, he of course asked me about what, how's the new album doing? What, what, what's you know? I finished recording it. And I said, yeah, it's a continuation and the conclusion of this story, you know. And uh, I, whenever I get the time, I sit down and write a movie script of these two albums because I know how what a movie script looks like and what it sh should be in there, you know. So uh, from from that box thing, and uh, that would be the first time ever that a horror movie was based on lyrics on, on, from two albums, you know? And he was very interested, and he said like, hey, we already work together now, you know, so keep me in mind. So what we'll do, once that is finished, whenever I find time to do it, it'll be like presented to several movie comers, see whoever is most. Uh, this is another magazine I write for, a film magazine here in the States. I often write about Macquarie. I know, of it, yeah. Editors there, and he sometimes gets me stories to do for them. And he's always asking me, you know, because I, I sometimes look at a story for, like, uh, for Faces, which is a metal magazine, and if it has some kind of horror application, I'll maybe do something for them too. Yeah. And then, you know, I had told him about the them out last year, and he was like, you know, this is really interesting. Is he going to make a movie? Is he going to do this? Let's do some I want to do something on his thing. Yeah. So I think that, you know, from what he's told me, there's a lot of interest in the horror film. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great to know because you know that's something you, I have no idea of knowing. Now I know from this one guy. But again, you know, you'd like that to be like more companies, maybe even bigger companies, interested, you know, uh, in doing that, so you can do it properly, because. Yeah that kind of thing should be done probably, you know, and, and then we could do the entire music score for it. So, yeah, so that, that would be, that. that's a dream come true for my, from, you know, that's a goal up there that I really want to try and achieve, you know. What about, um, I remember last year, um, seeing you guys on that, that horrible, horrible show, mm. and I was just wondering, if you thought that you know, they would even though it turned out the way it did, I'm sure it was a good exposure because uh, a lot of people, you know, most people 
realized that I, you know the newspapers the next day who reviewed his show said it was it sucked you know it was the worst oh, yeah. show it was so one-sided everybody could see that he just wanted a certain opinion put across to people and I think a lot of people anyway could see that as well watching the show and we definitely made an impact on people you know and, and uh, a lot of people knew of us after that yeah. and it's not like people were scared away or anything you know because we, we met people at restaurants and shit during the tour you know and yeah. who are you oh King Diamond uh, isn't that, weren't you on, you know, and that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, you know, you always get a little extra treatment and stuff like that if you've been nice. But so, And they treated us as if we were nice, so there was no problem there. But uh, it was just like, it was a sad way it was done, the whole thing, you know, because we were told that this would be a documentary on Satanism. And I thought, okay, finally, once and for all, on TV, we can make it. You know, we can tell people that it is, we can at least tell them that it is not these things that you think it is, right. at least that should be put across. Did you feel betrayed by him kind of Totally, totally. Yeah. Like they, he sent a crew to Florida. Uh, I did over half an hour of interview uh, covering any subject within uh, heavy metal. Uh, you know, influencing kids uh, and against Satanism and in every direction you can go within that, that thing, you know. And he used something like that, yeah. And then he said, bullshit afterwards, you know. It's like, fuck you, man. <laughs> but I, at least he broke his something. nose after that, so I can be happy about that. Did you just, like, dedicate something to him at the Ritz show? Yeah. <laughs> some, some kind of nasty comment, it was really funny. And then, uh, but the, the weird thing was that, uh, you know, he was standing with that satanic Bible in his hands at the during that show, and if they had just been a little smart, one of these people over there, you know, and asked him to, to read, uh, please read from the top of page 89, you know, he would have been totally fucked all over. Because he wouldn't have done that, I'm sure, because it says that uh, under no circumstances would a true Satanist ever sacrifice a child or any kind of animal. Black and white. No, not at all, that's why. all the time. Uh, it, it, when I have time I read horror books and I watch a lot of horror movies and I listen to music. And um, the last book I read was James Herbert book. I don't know if you know James yeah. Herbert. Yeah, from, from the English writer. Not Frank Herbert, but James Herbert. Yeah. Uh, the last one I, I read was uh, called Despair. Did you write the books, uh, the series of books about rats? Yeah. I read the rest. They're great. Yeah. I, think, I think, in my opinion, that's the uh, maybe not the scariest guy, but the most disgusting guy when it comes to the, He can write the most disgusting stuff, make you feel real. You can really feel like you're there, you know, the way he describes these things. Like, you know, I, I, I see myself, you know, every time I read his books at certain points, I'm just like, you know, put the book down like you said. Oh. I think he's actually kind of underrated. Very, yes. No, he's done some really great stuff. There's one called Shrine, which is really good, and uh, yeah, the Red Books, the Dark is pretty good too. Uh, he's done quite a few. Which that's the one that I finished lately. Yeah. Really? Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. Weird stuff. Weird theories. <laughs> I have some of his books, but I haven't gotten around to really reading them. I saw the, the movie Hellraiser, I was not too impressed by it. It's got some good effects in there, you know, but uh, I don't think the storyline is that good in, 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 in that one. Um, Dean Arcoons, I read a few of him, I think he's really good too. I bought all the stuff of this, but I haven't had time to read all of it, but it's nice to have like this storage bag on with tons of books whenever you just grab a new one whenever. And Stephen King of course I, I read a lot of it. I, I love yeah. 
It's it's yeah, I like I like it, but uh, I still like the book a million times better. It's it's a lot more scary, but that's the way it's gonna turn out always. I think it was a very good portrayal of of the book, you know. Oh yes, especially compared to the other. Yeah, definitely yes. But I heard that that this, a lot of people over here had this uh, associate made this association with with this guy from Monsters that was in. Oh, the, uh, I know. I I didn't have that you know uh, kind of things because I I haven't seen too much of that uh, the monsters you know because we've been not been here too much and I haven't really gotten into that stuff and I didn't even know that he was the one so that was probably good for me yeah. instead of people saying oh that's him you know it's terrible when people when somebody gets that associated with a role that they can't get out of it again. The tape that you've listened to, uh, the bass is not, you, you don't hear his notes as clear as you do now that we master it. During the mastering, the bass lines came out, you could uh, try and ask Monta about because he heard the master cassette copy compared to, to the ones that, that was done before the mastering. And the drums are clearer, not louder or anything, and the bass is a lot clearer, not creating any, just a very tiny frequency was brought up a little bit, which makes you able to, and you'll hear some great bass lines, which reminds me some of it like Gary Dane, you know, uh, like a real bass playing, you know, not guitar riffing, but bass playing. And him and I worked out quite a few of these bass lines, because when he recorded his bass, there was the only drums to play to, and he didn't really know what kind of song lines I would do, and I had my song lines in the head, so I was like, a lot of the bass was worked out, uh, played to the to vocals, instead of playing to like guitars, or which works out really great for, for a lot of places, but he goes totally out doing his own little melody. Sometimes he does melodies that just, you know, it will fit my singing, but it's not just the notes that I'm right. singing. Do you, you guys write songs? How much do you have, uh, like, when you come up with, like, let's say, the main riffs and vocal notes and stuff, do you have it planned out exactly what you want, the drums, the bass, the guitars, and stuff like that, or do you kind of let, let, let the other people in the band put its contributions to? They, they, they can contribute when the full, what we did this time around is probably best to explain what we did this time around because uh, we sat down, you know, in the, in, on the former albums I wrote like 90% of the music. This time around it was obvious that Andy is so much into the style now. It's never been like, I do 90, you do 10, not at all. But I've been so much into this style of music since Merciful Fate, so it was easy, very easy for me to write that style of music and make it fit within the, the concept. For Andy, it's been a little harder coming in, doing a totally unique style of music and then and getting used to it. But around this time, it's like, you know, it's become natural. So we split up the music. It, it turned out to be 50-50 this time around with the music. And uh, so he wrote some songs on his own. I wrote songs on my own. And then we uh, arranged everything together. The whole thing is arranged by him and me. And then we go... Uh, one of the songs, when Amon belongs to them, it was the only one that we co-wrote. And the funny thing is that I wrote the, the, the rhythms for, for the solo parts, and he wrote the, all the rhythm stuff for the vocal parts, which is like the other way around, it should be. But uh, then we sit down, you know, we uh, have these guitar riffs and stuff. Then we sit down and try to program drums into to get an idea what it'll sound like if there were drums. Of course, it's not the kind of drums that should be there, but it gives an idea what kind of tempo do we, do we want. The double bass drums here, do we want really heavy, do we want soft playing here, what do we want, you know, for different uh, parts. We always make sure when we write stuff, that's just the way we write, you know, that there are always a lot of mood changes so that we can, you know, so the music and lyrics goes 
uh, along. And there's a heavy change in the mood or something specific happens in the storyline, you know, the music will change as well. And uh, that we do by like writing all the music first, we arrange it like on a four track, then we rehearse with the band the music, and the drummer will contribute with his stuff, we'll tell him this is like an upbeat double bass drum, you know, come up with stuff, this is meant to be like this thing. Sometimes the drummer will come up uh, with, with a, a lot of extra beats, and maybe changing the whole rhythm around playing against the rhythm maybe, you know, against the root guitars and, and if it's cool, if it's really good, you know, then yeah, that's the way, that's what we keep instead of the other stuff, you know, and but otherwise they'll try and, and go by that, as you say, demo or whatever, yeah. go from that and then uh, develop that style, because that you, you, you can only do so much on a drum machine, like a small Roland drum machine. I know, I, I to, uh, yeah. It's nice. No, no, no. So that's the way that works out. With the bass, you know, uh, it's been like, we worked that out in the studio. Because that's where, at that time, I have a pretty clear idea of how the vocals are going and all that stuff. But they're rehearsing so that he knows all the basic stuff and he tries out while everybody's rehearsing, getting the songs together. He'll play his bass lines and stuff, you know, and come up with different bass lines that he's checking out. Some of them will work later on. Some of them won't because of the vocals that are, that are coming on last, you know. So, uh, and then I write the lyrics, you know. And the lyrics usually uh, written like I have ideas and builds. Finally one day when I have the whole thing, I write things down and then it becomes like a short story. That we divide into as many chapters as we have songs we want to record. And then, yeah. And then it's just like, you know, wherever the mood changes are. And that's the song that has that stuff, exactly. How about the production? I've heard the tape on the first video. It's a wild idea. Yeah. Do you see it different from half? I thought the production on the last album was a big forward. It's compared to the earlier one. So how do you look at this one? Is it similar to the last one? I think we're going to hit with this one uh, on several uh, matters, you know. I think the whole sound picture, the, the, the different instruments are like this. They really fit each other now. Levels and sound fits. I'd say on uh, them, for instance, if I have to criticize it myself, you know, it was lagging some bottom, some bottom. It was a little too dry, maybe, at certain points. The guitars were a little too... If you know what I mean, but that's... It's a matter of taste, you know. Then Abigail had that softer thing, but the guitars in Abigail were further down. And the drums might have sounded a little better on Abigail than they did on them. But then again, the guitars were sacrificed for that. On them, we wouldn't sacrifice guitars. So maybe the drums lag like a little and, and the bass is harder to hear. On this new one, I think the balance is perfect. You can hear everything, especially after the mastering, you can really hear every bass note that he's playing. You can hear his nice melodies. I couldn't hear it before we mastered it. I could hear a lot of it, but there were certain parts. I know he's doing things there because we were sitting there developing it together and it's not there now. I can't catch the notes. But mastering it at Sterling with uh, uh, Harvey Weinberg, he knew exactly what, when I told him that this, should we just do this and that, you know. Uh, It's been, it's been Andy and and uh, Roberto and I who kind of produced the albums, yes. creating the, the guitar sound, the drum sound, the bass sound. We produced the album this time around as well. Yes. Then we had we had Chris Tangaridis come in. We wanted to use him for the mixing, and uh, but he came in to, supposed to to produce the vocals as well as mixing the album with us. But uh, that didn't work out at all because he didn't understand my voice, you know. Uh, he, he, he didn't know what I could do with the voice. He didn't know the way we used to do choirs and stuff like that, you know. So it fell totally apart. So he took over producing the guitar solos. And I worked with Roberto Vaccaro, who I, you know, we know exactly how to put those vocals down. 
So that was the way we worked it out. And then uh, uh, Chris and Chris and Roberto and I mixed the whole stuff. And some time towards the ending of the mixing is where Chris said to me one day, now I know what it is you, you're going for with your vocals. So, you know, it, it takes time. It takes time to, to get an idea of what's going on in my sick brain. You know? Yeah, we haven't recorded any uh, extra material for this album. It's 47 minutes long, and it's like we didn't see any reasons to put out a 12-bit single for anything. Uh, maybe if this movie comes out, depends on when they'll finally finish this stuff off. We might release, uh, like you know, some of these movie tracks and record maybe a brand new King Diamond song because I know Pete has got a couple of songs, but. Uh, uh, we didn't want to risk him coming up with material for the first time ever uh, in King Diamond with a concept album as deep as this and uh, you know not knowing whether how his compositions would turn out. We wanted to test out his compositions on some 12 inches. But then we have from the company that they uh, were not planning to do that. So it's like, oh well. But if that movie comes around, or if we want to put that out maybe as a special uh, King Diamond movie, you know, uh, bits and pieces and this ending credit song and then we'll make a longer version of that ending credit song probably and then uh, record another brand new song on a piece to check it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure, yes, I'm sure. We, it was the plan, but again, time-wise, uh, the guitarist Pete was supposed to, to be uh, in LA like three weeks before the bass player to work with us with his song, so we could like try and arrange them as well before the bass player came and we before we had to like go into uh, the rehearsal rooms. But uh, he had problems back in Sweden getting away, so uh, you know he came at the same time as a bass player and there was and so there was no way we could do it you know it was, it was just too late to do it this time around A little longer set this time, probably two hours, I guess, getting close to two hours. But we want to present the story, you know, as the right order of songs. But we're gonna like, from then we're gonna pick the four songs that uh, are the most visual on stage. We're not gonna. People are used to us opening up with the, the intro and the new first song on the new album. This time around, it's gonna be Welcome Home. That we're opening up with, and we'll do uh, T, and the next will be uh, uh, the accusation chair, then the little piece, them, and then Twilight Symphony. And then we cover pretty much of, you know, part of the essential right. things that goes on in the story. And then we'll head into like uh, all the stuff, you know, uh, songs from uh, Fatal Portrait and uh, Abigail, and it comes to the Sabbath, you know, and then we do side one of the new album. And then we do like a few other songs from uh, Fatal Portion, Abigail, and uh, Merciful Fate Madeley. And the last side, and no one calls. Because when I die, I'm dead. <laughs> yeah, that's what it. What can you do after that? <laughs> <laughs> I really top that. But we're trying this time around to make it a little interesting for ourselves as well. You know, okay, we're playing uh, the new album, of course, but the old material, you know, you play for years and years. Like, we're picking out songs that we haven't done for a little while, you know, like. From Abigail, we're gonna play take the same day of July uh, out of that. We played it for a long time now, and we'll uh, exchange it with uh, a mansion in darkness, which we haven't played. Actually, we only played on a few gigs so far, I guess. So that one we're gonna pick up again, 
And uh, so any more changes from from Eric here? And then again, Fail Porter, we're going to play Dresden White, uh, uh, which we haven't done for a while, and Karen, we haven't done for a long time either. Instead, I'm playing The Candle and Portrait, you know, that we pick those two songs out and then. Well, that's good because it also gives the fans who only saw you, let's say, the last tour, who only got to see those songs, and let's say, most of the last year, they'll get to see different old songs. Yeah, songs we played like three years ago, you know, we'll pick them up again and play them now. So I think that work out really good. Even when we were so fade, you know, in, the, in, in this medley thing, you know. People always go crazy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this time around, they, they'll have something special to go critical, be incorporating uh, non so no fun into the whole thing. Really? And that's like an old, old. Oh, yeah. That's, the, yeah, the first mini album, right? So, I guess that's about it. is the powers of the unknown, the powers of darkness. And that is very much the expression that covers the word Satan, you know. It, within real Satanism, Satan means the powers of the unknown, the powers of darkness. And them is powers, these powers. It, the, the album could be called Satan. <laughs> but that's again the whole thing, using other words for the same things, you know, uh, still the same subjects, but it's just made more interesting because it's stories and stuff, and we did with Fade Now's stories, you know, full concept, and uh, uh, Amon is uh, a name of a demon taken from the Satanic Bible, and that specifies, uh, say, almost rebirth, but like returning, starting all over again, kind of rebirth, and that is what happens time after time in that house. Grandma was put away the first time, you know, came back, started all over again. Then everybody was out of the house, and I came back to the house this time. And uh, they are not really in the house anymore. Only Missy is in the house. But they have full access to the house if they want, because we make a special deal, you know so that I can see Missy again. I have to make a deal with them this time around, giving the house away to them so that Amon belongs to them. And that's, that's the reason there. And that's where you hear these voices just talked about, it's Lena's nice and then let us make you an eternity. You know, that's... Do you think, I mean, as an elegant singer, do you think that there's something about you that you more than here what you say right now that, you know people who are really digging into the lyrics and finding these things because there are so many things in there that are in between the lines oh, yeah. meaning things you can compare to real life and whatever you know especially now that you have it's like I find when I read the lyrics on the new album makes me want to go back and read the ones on the <laughs> yeah. you know it gives you more mm -hmm. excited for that than yeah. it just builds yeah Yeah, I think there's a lot of irony in there this time oh, around. Yeah. The, the song Lies with Dr. Landau, you know. Oh, yeah, it's great. It's like, <laughs> it's just like... And then I get the sick wedding theme, you know. It sounds so, uh, it sounds so sick. First time it sounds pretty normal and nice. But it stops in the middle of the theme, right? During the wedding dream. Then comes these chords where I start to sing. 
and then it goes a couple of uh, what is it notes up and starts all over again the same thing that's to me it just sounds so bloody sick you know and that's still with humor in it and this so, something I, I really laughed at while we recorded it I freaked out that was the, when we did this little horror piece called Let It Be Done on the new one where the priest and the doctor is talking together right and suddenly, you know, uh, this harpsichord comes in like, dun 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 and then that's over with. Just like some maniac sitting there, I just see this maniac right in front of me, like playing this harpsichord, like totally freak, you know. Just comes out of this horror thing, and then it has since these violins are still going behind, it gets this windy effect over it. I don't know if you noticed that. It goes like. Oh yeah. I tell you, them, we really had them in the studio this time around. Really? I should tell you just one of these things that happened there. One of the, one of the night we were sitting there, you know, in the control room, there was Roberto and this Chris Sangriza and myself. And they had this, close to these, and uh, suddenly started moving, going like crazy like this in the studio. And then it went down like, nobody touched it. It was just standing over there. And, I, and we started talking a little about these things. I tested it like this and went over like, and it stopped because it was hitting the edge here. It's like, fuck. <laughs> and then we told the second engineer, it was a girl. And she uh, said, oh, I totally forgot you should have seen yesterday. And that really freaked me out. She said, you know, we uh, 48 tracks, two machines. Synchronized when they run, you know, right. and then uh, you can't have one of the machines just stops. That's impossible unless you press a button on top of the machine.